Well, hello, you wonderful people. I have the extraordinary privilege of speaking to you today, and I'm excited about this message. I believe that the Word of God has the power to change our lives. I believe there is comfort in the Word of God. Maybe whatever your situation or circumstance at this time, that's what you need. I believe there is peace in the Word of God. And I believe there is transformation. I'm really believing that God is gonna speak to individuals, speak to families, speak to situations so that you can be changed into all that God wants for you. And I also believe there is gonna be challenge in this message tonight. So why don't you get ready with me and we're gonna pray and believe that God is gonna say something profoundly important to you and to us as a church. Okay, let's pray together. Father God, thank You for these wonderful people. Thank You that every single person who is listening right now is valuable and significant in Your sight. I thank You that You've got a plan and a purpose for each one of them. And I pray that through this message, You will speak to each and every person who is listening in the Name of Jesus. And everybody all over the place raised your hands and shouted, Amen. Well, you don't have to do that, but the idea is that you're in agreement with me. Well, I have two objects with me tonight that I want to highlight. The first is a piece of rock salt. I picked this up in a salt mine in Salzburg, which if you don't know, means salt city. So there's a piece of rock salt and I have a first century oil lamp. I'm not sure it really is first century. I brought, bought it in an antiques shop in London. It's probably a fake, but that's what a first century oil lamp looks like. So why have I got salt and light? Well, you will know the answer to that because these are the two images that God described or used to describe our purpose. I'm just going to read what Jesus said, and then I'm going to unpack why He may have said it. Listen to this. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Well, can I just suggest that Jesus used two very strange images, light and salt. What is the connection between the two? Well, both are essential for life. Salt is essential for every cell in your body. Every nerve cell requires salt. Without salt, we would die. But light is also essential for life. If there was no light, there would be no plants. If there would be no plants, there's no oxygen. If there's no oxygen, there's no life. So Jesus used two essential things, but also He used two very stable things. It's very difficult to change salt. It's also very difficult to change light. They're both stable. But I like this, they're also very paradoxical. What do I mean? Well, salt is NaCl. That's the, the chemical formula. It's made of sodium and chlorine. In other words, it's made of a silver, beautiful metal, but also a poisonous gas. Don't you find it strange that God used that image to describe you and I? But I actually don't think it's very strange because we are both beautiful and poisonous at the same time. Humanity has the power to do good, but also the power to do evil. We are, as many describe us, fallen 
image bearers. So that stable salt is indicative, symbolic of humanity. What about the light? Well, this is also paradoxical because a beam of white light shone through a prism will automatically divide into the seven colours of the rainbow. Shine the seven colours through another prism and it goes back to white light again. In other words, light is symbolic of both unity and diversity. So whereas salt is symbolic of an individual or humanity, light is symbolic of the unity and diversity of the church. So Jesus chose these two images and they have huge symbolic value. But I think He chose them more because both are influential. Both salt and light change their circumstances without being changed themselves. Let's have a look at uh, a couple of Scriptures here. Salt, of course, has an unseen influence, whereas light has a seen influence. Here's one Scripture in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 21. Then he went out to the spring. He's talking about Elisha the prophet and threw salt into it. Why did he do that? Because the water was poisonous, saying, this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha has spoken. I really believe that is not only our calling as individuals, but our calling as our church, Hillsong Church, the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has a responsibility and an opportunity to bring purity to a polluted world, to, be, to bring healing to a broken and damaged and ruined world, if you will. God has called us to be that unseen influence, just like salt in a piece of beef will stop it becoming corrupt. You, in your workplace, in your family, in your community, in your situation, can prevent corruption. That's a huge calling and a huge responsibility. Well, what about light? Well, look at what it says, John chapter 1, verse 4. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We're living in very dark times. There are all manner of challenges and problems and difficulties, but we shouldn't be influenced by the darkness. We should be the influencers of the darkness. Salt changes the meat. The meat doesn't change the salt. Light changes the darkness. The darkness doesn't change the light. We are of those people that shouldn't be as impacted and influenced by the darkness and the difficulties and the challenges in this world. We should stand out. We should be influencers. But in order to fulfil that purpose, I believe this Scripture says three profound truths that you and I need to grasp. So I'm going to talk about what it is to be called a city on a hill. And if you're taking notes, which I hope some of you are, you can put that at the top of the page, a city on a hill. That's what Jesus said we should be. But in order to fulfil that destiny, in order to fulfil that purpose, we've got to know things. And this passage talks about three things that you and I need to know. The first is this, we are something. We are something. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The first thing in order for us to fulfil our purpose and make a difference in the world is to genuinely believe that we are something. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church and he says to all of those people who are faithful in Christ Jesus and the saints in Ephesus. Those two statements in Ephesians 1.1 tell us how we can find our identity. We are who we are in Christ and we are who we are in community. 
Can I just encourage you that you are blessed in Christ, redeemed in Christ, justified in Christ, made holy in Christ, but you're not just made holy in Christ. You find your identity in the church, in Hillsong. There is a corporate identity being part of the church. That's why we encourage people, even though we're separated, you are on your own listening to me, maybe in your living room, we're separated by technology, but we're still in community. We are in Christ and in community. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that there is something different about us. I've told the story before, but I was with a group of professionals, lawyers and doctors. They didn't know that I was a Christian and we got into discussion. And then one of them said a really strange thing. He said to me, who are you? And I said, I I, I explained who I was. And they said, no, there's something about you that's different. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I wanted to get angry with that person across the room and I was just about to swear, but I couldn't swear because you were in the room. Now think about that. They didn't know that I was a Christian or a minister. There wasn't any sort of guilt involved. They just saw that I was different. Can I suggest to you that you are different? You've got to believe that you are something, but you don't just know that you are something. This passage says we have something. When Jesus is describing light and salt, He says that you've, you have something, you've got saltiness, you've got light. You need to know your distinctiveness. Ephesians chapter one and verse three, Paul goes on. Having said you are in Christ and in community, he says, you've got every spiritual blessing in Christ. You and I have got something. Do you really understand that? Do you know that you not only are something in Christ, not because you deserve it, but because God has chosen you, but you have something. I remember many years ago, our our, uh, neighbours knocked on our door and uh, we, we knew them reasonably well, but they, they weren't believers. They didn't go to church. And yet they knocked on our door and said, where do your children go to school? And we said, well, they go to the local school that the church is set up. It's a Christian school. And they said, can our children go there as well? And we said, well, why do you want your children to go to our school? And they said, we want our children to be like your children. Here's our neighbours watching us from a distance and say, I don't know what it is, but you have something and we want what you've got. Do you believe that you are something and you have something? And the third thing this passage talks about is that we do something. We need to know our purpose. Both salt and light do something. It says salt is good for something or light is put on a stand. You and I have got a job to do. We've got a task to complete. We've got a destiny to fulfil. Remember, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church. He says, you are something in Christ and in community. You have something, every blessing that is in Christ. And then in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, you've got something to do. He says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know your calling? Do you know your task? One of, one of the uh, things that God has called me to do or be is a reconciler. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about he, him being given a ministry of reconciliation, a message of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, he says, the love of Christ compels me. Well, can I just say one of the reasons I'm talking to you tonight is because I have found my purpose. I've found my task. The love of Christ compels me to tell you, you are something, you have something, you can do something. And that 
desire for reconciliation. One day, a number of years ago, uh, I heard my neighbours shouting in the garden next door. At 12 o'clock at night, they were shouting and fighting, my two neighbours. So much so that uh, my children were woken up. So I immediately went downstairs and I parted them. And I got a fist uh, to, uh, for my pains. You may say, well, why, why did you go and do that? Because I'm compelled to reconcile. I'm doing everything in my power to fulfill my calling, to complete my task. What task has God given you? What is it that you're gonna stand before Jesus and explain, well, you told me to do this and I did it. So when Jesus just uses these curious images, you are the salt of the uh, earth, the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. What is He saying? He is saying, you are something. You have something. You can do something. But then He talks specifically about being a city on a hill. Let me just read it to you again. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Can I just encourage you that in order for each of us as individuals to fulfil our destiny, we need to know we have something, we are someone and we have something to do. But if we're gonna fulfil our destiny as a church, we need to take this into consideration. I believe when Jesus talked about a city on a hill, He was referring to Jerusalem. Everybody knew about Jerusalem. It was on a high place. It was on a hill. In order to get to it, you've got to go up. You could see it from a distance. In other words, it was a place of visibility, a place of pilgrimage, a place of worship. It's where people went. And it was also a place of aspiration. People went there to be blessed, to be touched, to be changed. Can I just suggest that Hillsong Church has been called to be a city on a hill. You've been called to be a city on a hill. The church has been called to be a city on a hill. Three things that this passage says about a city on a hill. A city on a hill, number one, is visible. We are called to be up to a place of prominence. We're meant to to be seen. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, For you were once darkness before you knew Jesus, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Look, if you're anything like me, you don't like to be prominent. You don't like to be seen. When I became a Christian at university, I had a friend called Peter who wasn't a Christian, but he loved to put me on the spot. And he would say before I even entered a room, he would tell everybody that I was a believer. And then I'd walk into the room and they would all look at me strangely. On one occasion, we were doing some experiments in a workshop and he shouted from one end of the laboratory to the other. He said, Robert, you believe the Bible, don't you? Well, I had to confess, I believed the Bible, I believed in Jesus. He wanted me to be seen. Well, I should have wanted to be seen. Don't try and hide your faith. Christianity may be personal, but it is not private. God has called you to be seen in your workplace, in your community, in your street, in your family. Listen to what uh, one commentary says about this passage. A secret disciple, is no more use in the world than one who has lost its distinctiveness. A secret disciple is no more use in the world than one who has lost his distinctiveness. So a city on the hill is visible. Secondly, a city on a hill is distinctive. We're called to live differently. This passage in Ephesians, I've already quoted Ephesians 5.8, but it goes on. 
Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Can I just encourage you that God has given you the capacity and the responsibility to stand out in the world. We're always trying to fit in, dress like everyone else, look like everyone else, do what everyone else is doing. But can I just encourage you in this despairing world, you should be a beacon of hope. You should be a beacon of positivity. You should be an example of unity. You should be a blessing where there is cursing. You should be hope where there is despairing. You should be health where there is sickness, you should stand out. Understand that you are called to be visible, but you're also called to be distinctive. And the third thing, a city on a hill is influential. We are called, you and I are called, the church is called to bring hope to our nation. In these desperate times, people are desperate for hope. They're looking for answers. They're looking for solutions. And I believe they're looking for hope. The Bible says that people are without God and without hope in the world. Well, we have hope. This passage in Ephesians 5 goes on. I love this verse. It says, Ephesians 5, 13, but everything exposed by the light, that is you and I, becomes visible. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Listen to this. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. In other words, if you become and act as the light of the world to your neighbour, your neighbour will become the light. Your neighbour will become a Christian. Your family will become a light. Your family will become a Christian. In other words, God has not only given us a responsibility to be salt and light, He has given us the transformation ability to change the world in which we live. God has set you and this church on a hill so that it can be seen, so that it can be distinctive and so that it can be influential. And you say, well, what happens when I do that? Well, this is the good thing. When you become the person that God has called you to become, when you become the light of the world, you will point towards the real light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 and verse 12 says this, When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you are salt, people will look to Jesus. If you are light, people will look to Jesus. If you remember the story of John the Baptist, he had followers, he, dis, he had disciples and they followed Him wherever they went and they followed His instruction and His preaching. And then one day, Jesus, the light of the world, the Lamb of God came into the crowd and He shouted, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And all His disciples left John and followed Jesus. That's what should happen to us. They're not following us. They're following Jesus in us. The city on a hill is not about prominence for the city. It's about prominence for the Creator. Can I just encourage you wherever you are, or can I ask you wherever you are, do you know the light of the world? I suspect you're listening to this message and on this uh, link because you want to know some answers in life. You want to find answers. Well, the answer is not in our value system or even our community. The answer is in Jesus. Can I ask you this question? Are you in relationship with Jesus? Do you know Him? Do you know that He's forgiven you? Do you know that He's changed you? Do you know that He is the Lord of your life? Because if you don't, you can. You can today put Jesus as your light. And as He becomes the light of your world, you will become a light to the world, to your world. 
Would you like to pray a prayer with me? That's all you've got to do, just pray a prayer and that will be the beginning of your journey. All right, why don't you do that? I'm gonna pray a prayer and you just, wherever you are, just pray this prayer with me. And this will be the first step in your journey toward light. Stay with me and just pray this prayer. Jesus Christ, I realise today I need You. Please come into my life as You promised. Change me as You said You would. From today, with Your help, I will follow You. Thank You that everything changes from today. I am, according to Your Word, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And from today, I'm going to make a difference in my world. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Well, congratulations to all you wonderful people who have prayed that prayer. And can I just encourage you, if you've prayed that prayer, what I want you to do is to, in the chat, just put that statement in the chat. Just write in, I prayed that prayer. And if you prayed that prayer, we will do everything in our power to encourage you, to support you and help you. And can I just say to everyone, you know, this world is in shadow at the moment. Everybody is looking uh, for, there's just so much confusion, there's so much shadow, there's so much uncertainty. Well, if you are walking away from the light, you will walk in your own shadow. But if you walk toward the light, your shadow will be behind you. Can I just encourage each of you, wherever you are, whatever your circumstance, walk toward the light out of your shadow and then you will become the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Father God, thank You for these wonderful people. I pray that You'd bless every single one and may this week be a week where Your light shines in all of our lives. In Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. Well, thanks so much for being part of the service today. And I certainly pray that it blesses you immensely. I want to encourage you to take a moment to click subscribe to this YouTube channel to keep up to date with our church services and on-demand content that our team prepare for you. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry of Hillsong Church, as always, we give people an opportunity to give and you can do so by just clicking the give button and that way you can help us continue to reach people all around the world. Be blessed. We love you.